recording? Yep. Could you dim the lights at the front a bit? Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Silence! Thank you. Do you have a question? Yes. Are you the new supply? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Um, well, you see, yesterday was the full moon, so, you know, after the full moon, you know, it all sucks back in, you know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, when I do get a haircut, it tends to be rather extreme. You know? And, like, this, it's okay to think that this is a terrible haircut, because it is a terrible haircut. Because I took my 17-month-old at the same time, to like a cheap mall haircut place because the barber, like, it's kind of interesting, like the barber I've been using for years is like semi-retired and like the amount of time he's actually in his barber shop is like asymptotically declining. So, um, you know, I had to go get a terrible haircut, so it's okay for you to, I won't be insulted if you, if you point and laugh. But, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, yes, I am, thank you, yeah. It's interesting how, like, somehow this class has not suffered any detriment, whereas my other two classes have been terrible for trying to get anything done. Anyway, so yes, I'm feeling fine, thank you. Everybody's on the path to recovery. No more questions from you, sir, not unless it's course related. Uh, Detriments. Um, well, I've had to like hold them online or cancel them and try to make them up on the weekend, and then failed to be able to hold, catch them up on the weekend because I myself was puking my guts out. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's. I, I would not have considered that uh, course related incidentally. So. We got a lot to cover and not a lot of time to cover it in, so I'm going to try to keep the side track talk to the to a minimum until we plow through some progress on these friggin' slides, man. So um, last time we had just slightly gotten into the idea of expressions. Expe expressions are a integral and fundamental building block of any programming language. They are not completely dissimilar from the types of expressions that you would have calculated in your mathematical careers so far, except for the funny way in which variables now work. So, um, so it goes. Why are you not? There we go. So, you must understand what a literal scalar is, you must understand what a literal is most particularly. You must understand what operators do and are. It's not that hard because it's very similar to regular mathematics. You need to understand what integers are. You need to understand that floating point is the representation for real numbers in numerical computer systems. We're going to be studying floating point numbers in some detail later on in the course. If we ever get there, if I can get the let out. So, here is a plethora of binary operations over um, two variables a and b. All right, addition and subtraction and multiplication should, I hope, pose no barrier to understanding for anybody in the crowd. However. It may be interesting to review the difference between integer and floating point division. So, I want you to cast your brains back into the deep, misty recesses of your early education. I want you to recall long division, right? You guys did do long division, right? Good. So, essentially, you have two varieties of division operation, right? Second here is what you might think of as division with the decimal component in place. Division as performed by your calculator, right? The first one here is, however, integer division. 
If you think of the two results of long division, you have the, divi the thing that you calculate, remainder some other thing, right? This is the result of the division, modulo is the remainder, right? So we split the, those two results of long division up and give them separate operators, right? So in effect, what integer division gives you is a division operation which drops the, uh, drops the decimal component no matter how much that is. It's not a rounding operation, right? So, for example, if I have um, 8 divided by, integer divided by 3, I get 2. 7 divided by 3 is 2. 9 divided by 3 is 3, right? Whereas, of course, if we use only a single slash forward slash sign, we of course get 2.6 and 2.3 respectively. You'll notice that there's a little bit of floating point error hanging out at the end of these. So, uh, floating point error being something we talked about quite extensively last time. So, integer division is not a rounding operation. It is a truncation operation. Truncation is a, uh, that's a, that's a term that you will come to know and hate as you do your computer science degrees. To truncate basically means to chop off the end of it, right? Um, so that's what's happening with the decimal component here. Any questions about that? So, in addition to that, we also have the so-called modulus operator, right? How many people have heard of modulus before? How many people have not? For the benefit of those four people in the room, modulus, very simple to understand, gives you the remainder of the integer division. So, in this case, 3 goes into 8 twice, and the remainder is 2. Seven goes in, uh, 3 goes into 7 twice, but the remainder is 1. Right? Anybody have any idea what, modulus, uh, what the modulus operator is useful for? Any applications? Yes, sir? Check if it's, um, uh, you can check to see if a number is divided equally by another number. And what's the condition? What will happen if it is? Yes. So if the modulus is equal to zero, that means that you have a number which perfectly divides by another number. What's another uh, application of modulus? Yes? Yes, fine, OK. Yes? Say again? Topography. Cryptography. Cryptography. Um, yes, but you know, it's a uh, broad domain. To say that a particular operator is useful in a domain as broad as cryptography doesn't say much. I, I, I imagine they use addition as well a lot, too. At the back there. Uh, so, so if the numerator is an increasing value, then the remainder will limit repeatedly? That's the one I'm looking for. Thank you. So the modulus operator is capable of producing a periodic function, right? So let's just demonstrate that quickly. Let's say we have um, i is equal to 100, while um, and j is equal to 0, while i is, or, while j is less than i, we increase, well, Print J modulus ten then J plus equals one. There you go. So you can see what that little simple loop there has done 
has generated a repeating signal of counting from zero to nine and then repeating back again to zero. This is, um, in electronic signals analysis, we would call this something approximating a triangle wave, particularly if you offset it around the middle so that it goes from negative five to positive five or something like that. But it's a useful thing to know how to generate on the fly. All right? Any questions about that? You have to learn how to make the numbers your bitch. <laughs> yes? That's an excellent question, and th uh, thank you for bringing it up. So for those of you who were following a line in the terminal, um, if you make a mistake entering things in at the triple, uh, the triple caret command prompt, the only way to recover that mistake is to simply enter the whole thing over again, but correctly this time. Um, this is why, generally speaking, anything over three lines of code you put in a file and then you execute the file because, you know, it's much easier to edit a file than to go back and re-enter all of these commands, right? I can do it because I'm awesome, but you guys, it takes practice. You have to know what you're doing. Um, so if you're following along, it might be useful to put it in a file. Um, not do it in the, directly in the command line, but, you know, neither here nor there. Um, also, in some languages, the uh, hat character, which is a little uh, triangle with no bottom, is exponentiation. But in Python, it's two multiplication signs uh, in tandem. Any questions? Good. So, <clears throat> I've already talked about most of this stuff here. Um, order of operations. Generally, things follow Bemis with a few additional modifications. Things like function calls bind at a higher level uh, than anything else. And you know, there's a couple of, you know. We have a lot more operators than are indicated in Bemis, so you have to kind of, you know, do a couple of new layers for the new operators we have. But uh, in general, when in doubt, bracket, right? Um, still the safest and most reliable way to make sure that the uh, um, expression that you're writing is going to be interpreted by the computer in the manner you intend, right? Good. You can use integers and floating point numbers in the same expression. In general, the rule is that a uh, floating point number will contaminate any expression that it exists in. Uh, the, result in the result will usually be another floating point number, regardless how many integers went into it. Um, this is generally to this is generally because floating point, uh, you know, it's sort of thought you wouldn't be using floating point unless you needed the decimal component anyway. So to convert it to integer would be to truncate the decimal component and you'd lose it. So you're losing information. So that's why they sort of normally bump it to float. All right? Um, incidentally, if you ever need to convert between the two, which, you know, may come up, you can convert a floating point, uh, an integer to a floating point number. Um, sorry, I confused myself. You can convert a floating point number to an integer. Oh, and let me put that to the other side. It's hardly even visible there. There we go. I was obscuring that. Anyway. You can convert a floating point number to an integer by using the name int as a function name. I know we haven't talked about functions yet, but you'll get used to it. Yes? The code that I, oh, you mean the, the code that produces all these numbers? Oh, not that I right-clicked and that happened. You mean this, this execution? Um, 
I was demonstrating that uh, by using the modulus operator, you can produ produce a uh, counter that counts between two, spe uh, two specified values and repeats itself. Make sense? Good. So, I don't know what all that is about, but um, you can also convert an integer to a floating point number by the same mechanism. This is normally unnecessary, this one here. There are instances where it's useful to convert a float to an int, uh, but not normally in the other direction, just it doesn't come up very much. Um, normally, this is done by default by, uh, by any operation that you put the integer to, into anyways that requires or uses a float, so it's normally unnecessary. However, it is occasionally useful to be able to chop all of the decimal component off of a number and just have the whole number component. Make sense? Good. I've already done this demonstration, so uh, we'll just skip it. But if you weren't there, go watch the video. So, many, many mathematical functions are available that are not available by default. Um, this is normally universally true of uh, programming languages in general. There's actually, uh, at the risk of having a slight side tangent, one might wonder why one needs to import a, uh, import a library in order to be able to access something basic like a square root function. Right? Here's the reason in, uh, for any of you that are interested. Way back in the day, computers uh, floating point operations were extremely expensive on um, sort of the early personal computer. Um, thinking back in like the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s, uh, floating point operations were expensive. In fact, you, uh, one of the metrics that was used to distinguish high-end computer systems was a metric called flux, or floating point operations per second. Um, you know, Systems would boast of being able to accomplish 3.8 megaflops and other such interesting things. They often needed dedicated hardware modules sitting inside of the uh, CPU in order to specifically accelerate floating point operations. So, the math library basically contains a huge host of floating point operations, floating point mathematical operations, like square root and your trigonometric functions and, you know, um, exponential functions, even power functions, all of this type of thing um, uses floating point. In early uh, iterations of the computer, um, it actually would have cost a heck of a lot of memory um, and it was relatively inefficient to load these libraries by default because floating point operations were extremely rare and avoided anyway. You sort of only used them when you needed to. So, this is something that persists to this day. In most programming languages, in order to use the math library, you must import it. This is particularly true in C, which you'll study in 1x C3. You actually require a specialized compiler flag to be able to, compile, to, be able to import the math library. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so if you want to access um, any of your uh, sort of more interesting math functions, import math, we would have things like math.py, oh, not po, what am I talking about? Pi, there we go. So there's pi, you know, at least represented to the degree of precision that's capable in floating point representation. How many people have... Uh, how many people have pi memorized for more than 15 digits? You're better than a computer. Um, so, you know, cos math.pi, you know, you can see that trigonometry works. You've got uh, math.log base 2 of like 256. 
is 8. Notice all of these things are returning a floating point number even if the thing coming out of it is uh, you know, an integer, right? So yeah, log, that's just the, nat that's the logarithm with 2 as its base instead of 10. Um, you know, you've got natural log, you've got all of everything you can want. You know? But most particularly, the most common one that you'll probably need is math.squirt. Don't ask me why they called it that, but that's what they called it. Probably because it's short. It stands for square root. Any questions? Uh, yes, sir. Any reason to use that over uh, exponent of 1 over 2? Um, because uh, basically for compatibility of your knowledge with any other programming language, in Python, they've got like this, uh, they've got this neat little um, um, shortcut where you can basically just do that and it's the same thing, you know? However, not all languages hook things up like that. So, um, you know, it's my, uh, it's my goal in this class not just to teach you Python and to lock you in and constrain you to Python's conception of the universe. It is my goal that the skills that you learn in this class should be maximally transferable to sane programming languages. So, yeah. question. Um, you'd have to ask Edo Van Rossen. I believe the caret symbol has something to do from bit, bit Oh, yeah, okay, so they're using caret for uh, XOR. So, yeah, we'll talk about bitwise, maybe. Uh, we'll see. It's kind of, bitwise operators are a bit like, well, so to speak, they're a bit different, you know, you have to concept, you have to have, like, more of a conceptualization of how, like, the underlying integer representation representations work and like basically even if we're going to cover bitwise we can't get there until like topic six so hang on to your butts all right good so let's talk about variables I've already talked about variables um, to an extent um, so a variable is a region of memory which has been named that region of memory must always contain some specific value, even if this is a lot of chatter chatter going on. Even if that variable contains a so-called null or none value, in Python, null is none, that's still a concrete value which is stored in memory as a none value, right? So there's no such thing as memory that doesn't contain anything. Um, in general, when you're declaring variables, you want to name them something specific and something useful, so as to remind you what that variable is actually contained. Right? Just naming everything x1, x2, x3, x4, you know, it might be faster to write, but it, you're just doing damage to your own understanding of your code in the long term. In Python, and this is uh, for more of the, this is more for the advanced folks in the crowd. Um, variables can act, you can actually assign any object to a variable. So um, you know, once we get into object oriented and classes, how many people have used object oriented before? Okay, so a fair number of you. Um, when we generate objects. We will bind them to variables that look exactly the same as all of the rest of the variables we use. We don't even have to declare those variables as being of that class. Like we don't require, because in Python, we don't declare the bloody things with bloody integers, you know. Um, basically, Python is trying to intuit um, from the use of the variable what the data type is. And throughout the execution of the program, you know, if you have a variable and you have it as a Boolean, and then later on you declare that as a list, it'll basically just overwrite the Boolean with a list and um, sort of overwrite the type at the same time. Um, 
insofar as Python does type checking at all. Um, so yeah. Variables may contain upper and lower case letters and digits and the underscore character. In general, naming conventions are roughly the same as any other C-based language. Variables may not start with a digit and may not be one of the reserved keywords. Um, you can see the full list of reserved keywords uh, using the following lines of code. So let's just take a look at it very quickly. These are the words you're not allowed to use. Import keyword keyword.awlist. You may not use false, none, true, and as assert, async, wait, break, class, continue, def, del, elif, else, except, finally, for, from, global, if, import, in, is, lambda, non local, not, or, pass, raise, return, try, while, with, yield. <coughs> you may not use any of those as variable names. However, you may use a surprisingly, a surprisingly wide number of things as variable names, in fact. Um, in our temperature example that we did um, one or two weeks ago, we had, a, we had variables named min and max. Some of you who have used Python before may recognize that min and max are actually functions provided by the Python prelude. We, in fact, created local, variable, uh, local variables with the same name in the local context, which um, sort of blocked out the uh, definitions of those things as functions provided by the prelude for the purposes of that single function. Um, we provided a local variable that you know um, hid the global variable version, except it wasn't a variable, it was a function. Everything's, yeah, question. Does Python allow to variable names? Yes. Uh, not as variable names. Um, maybe? I don't know. Uh, I think it's allowed in strings. But it's, I don't think, I, no, I think in variable names you gotta, gotta do this. I might be wrong about that. Maybe they changed it in a recent thing. Who knows? But, um, yeah, I mean, are you trying to write first Python there? Well, let's talk about Python. I believe you can actually read a Python to do it that way. Um, yes, yeah, you can actually redefine a surprising number of things in Python. Um, does not allow emojis in, in variable names? Well, thank God. There are some languages that allow arbitrary Unicode name, uh, Unicode characters uh, for variable names, but uh, Python's not one of them. It's still too C based, I'm afraid. But um, yeah. There was one time we had a student in this class break the auto grader because they overloaded the equality operator, which as you can imagine is used in a lot of test cases to just always return true. And overload and like basically always return from a function a object of a class where equality was overloaded to always return true. And therefore, anytime we tested equality, over an object returned from a function in such a manner, it would always return true. Thus, um, you, had, you had to write one class at the top of the file, you know, uh, return an object of that class from every function that we asked you to write on the assignment, and you just got nearly per perfect on the assignment. Um, needless to say, we're up, we are aware of these tricks now. And uh, we have put a stop to it. We now have s custom software, which prevents that type of shenanigans. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, so I won't dwell on it too long or hard, because we've seen several examples of assignment already, um, and had slides on it, in fact. But the equal sign sets the value of a variable to the evaluated result of the expression on the right side. Right? This can be as long an expression as you like. It writes it into A. It is an instruction command statement to change the value, not check on whether two values are the same. So this is distinct from the equality comparison that I just talked about. If you want to check to see if two 
variables are the same or two expressions are the same or a variable is equal to an expression or any of those types of operations resulting in a Boolean result, you want double equals. And this is not sufficiently distinct from any other C-based language. Yes? Oh, for Python, is it double apostrophe for like the strings or is it? Mm. We'll get there when we talk about strings. I saw the keyword in it. So, very briefly, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, in Python, Python likes to pretend there's no such thing as a character. All characters in Python are encoded as singleton strings. You hear that sniggering in the crowd? That's why I hate Python. This is like every single bloody lecture. It's more of this, you know? Yeah, so there's no such thing as characters in Python, so to speak. All single characters are encoded as singleton strings, strings containing one character. So um, that whole thing where single quotes meant character and double quotes made, meant string, and that all made sense. Both single quotes and double quotes both denote string in Python. Um, you know, flying right in the face of their design ethic that there should only be one way to write things. Um, incidentally, there are a few other languages like, that do that, like SQL, but, you know. Anyway, so, um, I don't really recommend multiple assignment. I don't think it's useful, particular, like, unless you really know what you're doing and you really, really, really strongly care about, like, line count. I, like, unless you really, really care how long your program is, I wouldn't use multiple assignment, but basically, um, x gets 5, y gets 3 in this example. Uh, the one thing that you might think it slightly more efficient at is if you have to perform a swap operation. So, um, you guys have probably seen this before, but we'll do it anyway. So there's, a, there's like a traditional problem with swap operations that really illustrates to the beginning programmer how memory works, right? So let's say we had two variables, um, x is 5, y is 10, right? So I can call those up by just, oh, not new, by just typing the name of the variable and seeing what its value is, right? So let's say we wanted to take, the, take x, give it y's value, take y, give it x's value, right? The novice programmer would do something like this. Well, that's easy. You just do x equals y, y equals x, right? x gets 10, y still has 10, right? In the course of the first operation, we overwrite the value in x that we intend to send to y. We blow it out of existence, we delete it, it no longer exists. Therefore, when we attempt to write the value of x into y, we are in fact rewriting the value that was just written into x back into y. It's the same value, so there's no change visible. The way that you have to perform a swap inside of computer memory systems is you need a third temporary variable to store the value while you're switching the values around. So let's just restore x to 5 for the moment. All right? So temp is equal to x. x is equal to y. y is equal to 10. Now x has 10 and y has 5. Make sense? So when Python is performing multiple assignments, this will work to swap the opera to swap x and y, uh, saying x y is equal to y x. But the only reason that works is because Python is assigning this temporary variable in the background, right? It recognizes it as being a swap operation, and it provides the me necessary memory in order to perform that swap without having to tell you or involve you or anything like that. 
Python is not breaking the computer and performing operations which are impossible in other languages. It's just not telling you how it's doing it. Question? So basically, this was against Palatine? Sorry? This, this temporary thing that you did, was it against Palatine? Um, if you were to take this operation and break it down in terms of single assignment statements, that is what the computer, this is what that compiles to, basically. Does that make sense? It is cheating, yes. That's the whole point. Python is cheating. Yes. Well, would it be right to think of this as like having two drinks of like different liquids and then you bring in like a third cup and then you swap the drink using the third cup? That's, that's an excellent way of thinking about it. Uh, um, if you make the one modification and make, you know, make the drinks out of some kind of exotic material that will de like destroy the other liquid if it's poured into it, that's, that makes the analogy complete. But yeah, so the analogy is like imagine you have two cups, right, with like, um, you know, red Mountain Dew and regular Mountain Dew. And Mountain Dew is such a corrosive substance that it will destroy other Mountain Dew if it's poured into it. And whichever Mountain Dew is doing the pouring wins, and like, like checkers rules. Um, in order to get the fluid from one cup to the other, you need a third cup, right? You pour it into the third cup, then you pour that in there, and then you pour that in there, right? Make sense? That's how memory works. Memory should, like, it is, the physical analogy for memory is a good one, in, like, in general terms. You should think of memory as a series of glasses filled with varying amounts of fluid, or, you know, I often say you should think of it as a series of cardboard boxes with kittens with numbers on their backs. You know? So, the kittens are just for kittens. You can just think of abstract numbers and boxes if you want. But everything is numbers and boxes. Good. Um, I won't harp on this too much because I think that everybody in here appreciates this. But this program, it doesn't really, you don't really know what's going on. In this program, we understand that what's being calculated is the area of a circle, intuitively at first glance. That in using variable names which are meaningful is very important. Any questions? Good. So, let's talk about comments. I know I've been receiving comments, so uh, we should talk about how to put them in the code. So, those of you familiar with other programming languages may, uh, may be dismayed at the lack of multi-line comments in Python. Um, so those, how many people are used to uh, Java? C++, TypeScript, and um, so it, in these types of languages, you do like the slash star, star slash to do multi-line comments, right? Very convenient notation. You can like comment out large blocks of code all at once, right? Python doesn't have that. Uh, all lines that you want to comment out must be prepended by the octothorpe character. And incidentally, that's what that symbol is called, octothorpe. If I hear anybody call it hashtag, so help me Jesus. Um, so, for those of you who are new to programming, commenting out code basically takes a line of code and toggles whether or not it actually exists as part of the program, right? This is very useful um, in a number of respects. Um, number one, it gives you the ability to take sections or statements in your code and temporarily or permanently disable them so that you can test things, turn them on, turn them off. It's like a little light switch for lines of code, right? Very useful. The other thing it allows you to do is to put things into your code that are never intended to be executed, right? This would ideally be descriptions of the code itself. What does this comment do? What am I trying to accomplish here? Why am I using a loop here? 
Why did I use this library instead of that library? All these sorts of things, all these little decisions that go into the writing of a program are useful things to document. Particularly if you're uh, expecting yourself or anyone else to ever read this code at any point. Code itself is extremely difficult to read and understand. Um, if you're new to programming, you will not have an appreciation of this until you go out into the industry and try to uh, update or maintain some other person's code base. Um, it's extremely important to leave a breadcrumb trail of your thoughts for anybody who is trying to understand what the heck it is that you were doing. Um, Good source code includes lots of comments to help the reader understand the code. Um, there is such a thing as too many comments, but in general, at this point, you should err on the side of more comments rather than fewer. Um, even if they're not very good comments. Um, I believe it's um, Dr. David Parnas, who's a uh, uh, um, Professor Emeritus of the Computing and Science faculty here at the University of McMaster University once said that um, documentation is like sex. Even if it's bad, it's still better than none. I can tell that because this is an adult class. <laughs> right? You guys are adults, right? No, no, no eight-year-old snuck in? And I suppose we're broadcasting it to the... Uh, no, it's okay, because I put on the videos not intended for children, so, you know. Because <laughs> otherwise, it's like, you know, it's just, it's just so many hoops to jump through. Anyway. So, here's an example of some comments. This is obviously being over-commented for what the calculation is all actually doing. But good places to put comments at the beginnings of functions, telling us what the functions do. At the beginnings of loops, telling us what the loops are supposed to be doing. At the beginnings of large if conditional branches, telling us what those are supposed to be doing. Um, in fact, you can use comments as a design tool for the algorithm itself. Um, I find lately that when I'm programming, personally, what I'll often do is I'll lay the algorithm out as a series of comments. You know, I should do this, then I need to do this, then I need to do this, then I need to do this. I'll lay those out in comments, and then put the code that does that between the comments. And then, you know, test that it actually is doing what I think it is doing after I have filled in each comment block. Right? Test early, test often. Um, things that you should not do in comments. Um, you should not explain how the language itself works. Because if anybody is reading the comment, like if anybody's reading the source code, you, you should assume that they at least know how the language that you're programming in works. Or that if they don't, then they're intelligent enough to, uh, to know that here be dragons, and they just believe. Um, don't slag your boss off in the comments. Great way to get fired. Um, there's a really funny video uh, on, on, on YouTube of uh, Valve developers slagging off their boss in the, in the, in the comments. So uh, I recommend going and watching that after this lecture is done. Um, there's um, another thing not to do with comments is, like, don't, in contrast to this, don't comment every line. If something does something simple and basic and should be well understood plainly, um, you don't need to include a comment there. Like, it's like good writing in any other sense, right? Do you want to, do you want to read a book by an author who takes 10 pages to have like one plot point happen. No, it's boring. It's like signal to rate noise ratio, right? You want the like the book is only as interesting 
insofar as the interesting bits are separated by as little fluff as possible. Right? The same is true of any form of writing, but particularly technical writing. And writing of comments is considered a form of technical writing. Be clear, be concise, be to the point, don't waste the reader's time. Okay? And to the people in the crowd who are inevitably going to ask at this point, are we being marked for comments? We, you are not being marked for comments in this class. You are being marked on the raw basic functionality of your program, so comments are up to you as you say as a, to, uh, as a tool to help you write programs correctly. However, I will say that uh, getting in the habit of good documentation in first year is an excellent way to progress smoothly through your degree program. Any questions? Good. So. <coughs> So in the last three minutes of class, I'm going to throw Booleans at you. Uh, they're named after a guy, um, I believe a, a statistician in the 19th century. I could be wrong. But Booleans are another variable data type. They encode true or false values. Very simple. A Boolean is either true or it's false. There's no, uh, there's no middle ground, there's no middle way, there's no gray area. It is simply true or false. It is one or zero. We have various operations which may result in a Boolean result. Booleans are accepted by the conditional statements of if statements and loops. And in general, when you are controlling the flow of uh, execution through a program, you are doing so using Boolean variables. Or Booleans, they may not be variables, and you may not ever have a Boolean visible. But if you're saying something like that loop we had earlier, while i is less than j, the result of that calculation is a Boolean, which is being given to the loop. So, we've got various forms of comparison, less than, greater than, less than equals, greater than equals. We've also got Equal or not equal. These should all be self-explanatory. Once more, be careful about double equals versus single equals. Double equals is equality. Single equals is assignment. This is not so much an issue in Python, as in Python, It'll just tell you if you use the wrong one, give you a syntax error. Some languages are not so generous. In C, for example, it is not only possible, but in some cases even useful. Although I've, I haven't, I'm saying that without ever having actually seen a useful use case of this, but I'm sure they exist. If you perform assignment inside of an if statement, for example, it will perform that assignment inside of an if conditional, which should just make your skin crawl, any of you who know programming. So um, later versions of the C compiler will warn you if, it's, if it thinks you meant double equals and you use single equals. But you know, if you've turned your warnings off, then uh, you know it'll just let you do it. And that's kind of the C programming language all over. It'll just let you do things that are like very dumb. But uh, yeah, so there we go. Um, I don't think we, uh, yeah, OK, so we're out of time. Thank you very much for your time and attention today, folks. I'll see you in the next one.